created to make this conference possible to this uh, virtual global conference to the second keynote panel on the topic of changing paradigms in a pandemic world. How do you regain trust? And what a great day we had so far. We experienced 25 most insightful deep dive sessions. We heard from the keynote speakers in the inaugural panel. And I think we all relaxed very deeply in the relaxation lounge, in the meditation with Swami Jyotiamaya. And I believe we have all experienced this conference to be deeply meaningful as we come together as a global community. We come together here today to share our challenges, to share our best practices, and maybe most importantly, to share our hopes, our dreams, our plans, to share what energizes, uh, energizes us to deal with the challenge at hand. And uh, I just heard uh, far more than 3 million people have been uh, joining the discussions today, participants from over 100 countries around the globe, and many, many messages have reached us. I wanted just to read out three of them. Juan from Argentina has been writing, mental health is one of the biggest problems in the world today. And I find life so challenging in this new normal. I'm so happy that the WFEB has organized a conference that addresses, addresses all aspects of this topic. We also received posts from South Africa. Peter is writing, these last couple of months have been the most difficult in my life. I've lost my job and at times my health. This day has given me back the hope. And Jagoda from Slovenia writes, we often hear that hard times bring out the best and the worst in people. The COVID-19 pandemic is a great example of this. Thank you so much for the WVP Global for bringing together this platform for dialogue. And so this is a virtual conference and in a virtual conference we can all be agents of change we can share our voice and we would like to invite you to do that further on please do that you can tag the wfeb the world forum for ethics and business you could use the hashtag changing times and if you want you could even join the global challenge the challenge um, that we have created see the change and be the change so you go out and share at least one positive change which has come up in your life due to the pandemic yeah and you can hashtag it uh, uh under changing times but without much further ado i would like to introduce the incredible speakers which are lined up with us for this second keynote session we have with us miss rachita kulkarni the president of the world forum for ethics and business from oman his excellency dr Ahmed Mohammed Abayd Al Saidi, the Minister of Health of the Sultanate of Oman. Mr. Eric Solheim, the former head of the UN Environmental Program from Suriname. We had the President of Suriname speaking in the inaugural panel. The Honorable Mr. Amar and Ramadin, the Minister of Public Health from the Republic of Suriname. Mr. S. Sridhar, the Managing Director of Pfizer India and the President of the OPPI. From Guyana, the Honorable Dr. Frank Anthony, the Minister of Health. From Belgium, the home of the World Forum for Ethics in Business. And we just heard, um, it's incredible, the Honorable Professor Hermann de Croo, the Minister of State from Belgium, who is serving the Belgian government since 52 years. From India, Mr. Arvind Vachasvi, the Managing Director of Sri Sri Tattva. From Germany, the Honorable Professor Dr. Roland Koch. He's serving as a President of the Ludwig Erhard Foundation and as Chairman of the Supervisory Board of the UBS Germany AG. And obviously, he's the former Minister President of Hessen in Germany. Ms. Tessie Anthony de Nassau, she's the co-founder of Professors Without Borders and an Ambassador for UNAID. United Nations AIDS program. From Germany, we have Professor Dr. Christoph Lütke. He's the chair of the Peter Löscher, Peter Löscher um, uh, uh, Chair for Business Ethics and the director at the Institute for, Institute for Ethics in Artificial Intelligence at the Technical University 
of Munich. And last but not least, our board member of the World Forum for Ethics and Business and a former member of the European Parliament, Mr. Joe Leinen. So Rajita, uh, may I ask you to start the conversation? Uh, thank you very much, Christoph, for um, uh, contextualizing our closing keynote panel or the valedictory panel for this incredible global summit on changing paradigms in the pandemic world. Um, as we were discussing, it has been this, uh, this afternoon has been a, a carnival of ideas, a carnival of insights, a carnival of inspiration, of listening to experts, of listening to um, uh, people who have been impacted by the pandemic, of those who are policymakers, uh, those who are in positions of authority. And um, it, was so, uh, it was so humbling. At the same time, it was so empowering to see how really the world community has come together today to hold hands, to support each other, uh, to really uh, find strength in the solidarity that we are indeed a one global family. I think the fact that we can be the wind beneath each other's wings was born out today. And um, I, I feel very uh, honored that the World Forum for Ethics and Business is continuing its tradition of bringing to the fore important discussions, timely discussions, strategic discussions, like the one we are having today on the World Health Day about how our life has been recalibrated and changed because of the pandemic, and therefore what paradigms we need to change to, uh, to adapt to, to this new world that probably we are going to live in for some time to come. And, uh, you know, if, we, if I look back on this afternoon, we started about five hours ago. And in these five hours, we have heard from more than 150 speakers like yourself um, uh, from about 50 countries, the speakers represented, and our viewers represented uh, almost 100 plus countries from around the world. Christoph was sharing the numbers with us. Uh, what I was delighted by was how every voice, every perspective, every stakeholder in society, I think, uh, was able to participate either as a speaker or as a participant uh, in the live conversations. And I'm particularly happy that almost 40% of our speakers today were women. And I think um, along with um, uh, demographic diversity, cultural diversity, uh, gen and gender diversity. I think we upheld that today. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion today on World Health Day. Uh, we are discussing the impact of the pandemic on us. We are discussing how the pandemic has impacted not just our physical health, but our mental, emotional health. Economically, it has impacted us. Socially, it has impacted us. And uh, from this panel, what I am um, aspiring to hear, and I think to take away as an inspiration, is to listen to all of you uh, dignitaries, all of you experts in your field, uh, and all of you leaders um, on what hope we can carry forward as a world community, what we can do to, to stand strong with each other so that uh, despite the pandemic, we triumph as, as a world and um, we make sure that we are able to build a, a sustainable, solid, sustainable future for ourselves. We are committed at WFB to do everything that we need to and we can uh, to hold hands and to partner with our stakeholders, to partner with other institutions like we have done today uh, to, to make this discussion about how we can make the world a better place. So I want to thank all of you who have taken the time to be with us on this panel, excellencies, uh, you know, speakers, uh, leaders from all over the world. And I look forward to hearing from you and um, learning from you and look forward to partnering you and taking this discussion ahead. Thank you very much and very warm welcome to this conference. Thank you so much, uh, Rajit. And indeed, I think this day has given us all enormous strength and hope. Now, Your Excellency, Dr. Ahmed Mohammed Albaid Al Saidi, you are the Minister of Health uh, in Oman. Um, we look much forward to hear from you. The floor is yours. 
Uh, dear Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like first to start by expressing my sincere appreciation to the World Forum for Ethics in Business for inviting me to participate among this, of this group of highly distinguished leaders in this international symposium. Fellow colleagues, I don't think you want to hear more about how the COVID-19 pandemic has created panic and uncertainty across the globe and its ramification across sectors. We all know that. What matter is what we will do, what we decide to do with what we know. The pandemic demonstrated how gravely we need to reconsider the way we identify our priorities, use our resources, and most importantly, how we need to adhere to the noble and, of, and human principles of justice, fairness, and ethical businesses. Dear colleagues, we must seize the experience as an opportunity to seriously rethink a shift of paradigm in our basic conceptions and practices. The question is how? In my humble opinion, the starting point is admitting transparently that we as a world were not as prepared as we believed where we were, we were hit by this pandemic. Once we admit this and other hard truth, we must deeply believe in the need for concrete change and to take action towards achieving that. This may seem like too big of a task, but it is today's task and we must not put it off for tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Countries have learned valuable lessons from the intense experience and we will needlessly relive the past if we don't use what we have learned, learned. In Oman, for example, we learned few lessons such as preparedness plans are only effective if they are homogeneous, complementary, and comprehensive. During pandemics, we must get rid of needless division, for example, between health providers, private or public sector, or between individuals, whether they are citizens or expatriates. We are all one community. The world, the whole sector must act as one and ensure equity as we are only safe when everyone is safe. Second, public health needs strong health systems, not merely strong institutions. Each level of healthcare plays a pivotal role from primary healthcare network that provides a solid foundation to secondary and tertiary levels of care, to efficient administration and effective policy making. A strong healthcare system is one that focuses on prevention. This also includes strong partnership with the community and other sectors in the country, as transparency and detailed data flows can greatly enhance decision making, especially if they span all national systems. Healthcare system also requires minimum degree of local or at least regional production of necessities, such as the PPE, that's the personal protective equipment and basic medication and vaccines. Such baselines requirements should not be hostage to international production line, such as vaccine nationalism. Third, as Plateau said, necessity is the mother of invention. And this pandemic has created so many necessities that forced us to innovate, to innovate and further recognize the role of technology and smart solutions. At the same time, some of these necessities were not new, but they were brought under the spotlight during the pandemic. And as such, we must ensure that we utilize this as a starting point to renew and strengthen our investment in innovation and technology for health. I am certain that each one of you has their own set of lessons learned and priorities, yet none of us know what tomorrow will look like. What we all do know, however, is that we have everything we need to paint a brighter and better tomorrow, and we can do it together. We can start by identifying and eliminating the inequities, inequities and disparities in access to, health, to quality health care services, both as the national and global levels, so that every member of the globe community can access quality health care services when and where they need them. 
we can continue engaging the community in all our efforts and maintain the partnership to all a, to all times so that so that it's always ready during crisis we can shift our approach towards a whole of government approach which will allow us to work together in a coordinated manner conducive to jointly addressing the root cause of inequities we must also make the approach holistic uh, and focusing on face based response so we can determine the underlying issues handle the immediate effects and duly consider the consequences of any pandemic and as we nationally shift towards a whole of government approach so should we globally shift towards a whole of global community approach we should develop partnership to invest in, in uh, securing medical necessities for everyone by cooperating by cooperating yes to extend global production capacities particularly for vaccines and basic supplies there is no reason strong enough to stop us from doing this all what we need is a renewed resolve a stronger political will and i hope that you will see this symposium like me as an opportunity for each one of us to push for changes with stronger and revitalized convictions each and everyone here speaking or listening can play a role with that i'd like to thank the organizers for honoring me with the chance to speak today and all of you for your kind attention and i hope that we leave this symposium more determined to make a real and sustainable differences for global health thank you very much your excellency shukran thank you so much uh, for your contributions uh, you quoted plato uh, necessity necessity is the mother of innovation and i believe that is exactly what we need and uh, we would like to congratulate you and the country of Oman for how innovative you have been in coping with the challenge. Thank you so much uh, for your contributions. And I would now like to go back from the Middle East to Europe uh, to you, Mr. Eric Solheim. You have obviously served the United Nations as the head of the UN Environmental Programme. And is it so that over this last year we have been talking less about the environment, but more about health? How do you see, how do you see the situation? Let me start by quoting not a good person like Plato, but uh, the Russian revolutionary Lenin. Uh, he once said that there are decades where nothing is happening. And then all of a sudden there are years where decades uh, are happening. And I think 2021 was such a year. Decades have been happening. Enormous suffering, enormous number of deaths, but also great promise for a better world after the pandemic. But that depends on us. If we can learn the lessons from this catastrophe, uh, we will create a much better world getting out of this, which humanity has done in many, many crises in the past. And let me point to three main lessons learned. First of all, which is very much in the spirit of the World Forum for Ethics in Business and uh, the inspiration from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, togetherness. We are into this together. We are one humanity. If we find solutions and work together, no task is too big. If we allow people to split us, uh, we will be divided and very, very weak. And we saw this crisis, this disease starting in China, then moving on to Italy, then to the United Kingdom and the US, where from the beginning we had the highest number of deaths. Then all of a sudden the US and the UK became the best performers when it comes to rolling out the vaccines. As in small nations like the Seychelles, Israel, the Emirates being the top vaccinators in the world. And we have seen big nations like India and China doing something very difficult, which is to prioritize the export of vaccines to other nations before you have vaccinated your entire nation back home. That's great service to humanity, and it's not easy to pull off uh, politically. So we should be very grand grateful to the Indians and the Chinese, and also the Russians, by the way, uh, for, uh, for this. But if you are in it together and we, if we get that message, we will do well in the future, also when we face new big challenges like the climate and environment crisis. Second lesson, uh, political leadership matters. It's the most important issue. There is enormous difference when it comes to different nations' performance under these crises. The United States and Europe, 
the worst uh, hit nations in Europe have 50 times more death per capita than South Korea or Australia. We have 500 times more death per capita than China or New Zealand. We have 5,000 times more death per capita than Vietnam. And it's not that the Chinese, the Vietnamese, the Australians or the New Zealanders have done something completely different from Europe and the United States. They have just done it with greater resolve, in a more determined fashion, and with that much more uh, hard-hitting leadership. And then also the economy has come back much, much faster in these uh, nations. So political leadership matters. But the good news that is that in the midst of the crisis of Corona, we have seen great environment leadership, which was not there last year, before the last year. President Xi Jinping of China just uh, promised that China will be carbon neutral by 2050. The European Union has launched a Green New Deal. Prime Minister Modi of India is going solar in a large way. And just recently, just last week, President Biden of the United States launched a 2.3 trillion US dollars package, which is enormously green, investing in electrical charging in renewable energies and in environment upgrading of low-income communities. So the entire world can now look to China, India, the United States and Europe, the biggest entities in the world, and they will get the environment leadership. It frankly was not there just one year back. And the final lesson, nature is bouncing back. If we humans stop destroying nature, it bounces back very, very fast. In the midst of the crisis, we saw penguins walking down the streets of Cape Town, bears coming back in the streets of Barcelona, Spain, deer in the, in the Japanese uh, cities, and in the great national parks of the United States, the guards spoke about the party, the paradise for wildlife uh, during the pandemic, and in northern Indian cities where they haven't seen the Himalayas for 20 years, uh, because of, of uh, pollution, they could now for the first time again see these great, beautiful mountains. So if we take these three lessons at heart, nature will bounce back if we provide the political leadership and if we understand that we are in it together. There is a great uh, lessons learned for humanity and we, we will create a better society coming out of this crisis than society was getting into the crisis. And if you need inspiration, let's not take it from Lenin, but take it from a person which was all good. Mahatma Gandhi, maybe the most inspirational leader ever walking this planet. He said, you need to be the change you want to see in this world. To take that at heart, to all try to be the change you want to see in this world, uh, there's no limit to our achievements in the years to come. Thank you so much, Mr. Mrs. Solan. Thank you so much to remind us that we shall be the change we want to see in the world. And I think also um, bringing to light that nature is bouncing back and um, has maybe benefited from this year of Corona was very important. You also said that it's all about leadership. And uh, I believe true leadership starts where our knowledge ends. At the boundaries of what we really know, we need to show leadership. And I think all of us in this one year have reached exactly these boundaries. A leader who has shown great um, initiative has been the Honorable Mr. Amar N. Rabadin, the Minister of Public Health from Suriname. I think you had difficult times in this year. Uh, we look forward to, to hear about your reflections. Thank you. Uh, dear Chairperson, please allow me to observe the protocol that has already been established by the previous speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this virtual conference, it gives me great pleasure to be given the opportunity to contribute to the objectives of this conference, all to all that has been said today. Public health is about facing health problems as a group and using organized community approaches to resolve problems with epidem epidemiology as its core method. Public health assumes background principles of community and equality, which are made implicit in a system of ethics. While ethical decisions within the public health are not new, our experiences thus far during the COVID-19 pandemic call for a paradigm shift in the pandemic world. As human, we have often assumed being masters of our own fate and that the young are too young and too strong and therefore will not get sick. 
we have not taken responsibility for what happens to someone on the other side of town or in the world, and that it is someone else's fault in case of disease. However, the current pandemic contradicts all those assumptions. Since we are so interconnected, it can be medically and ethically necessary to have our freedom restricted by such practices as quarantine or social distancing based on the required physical distancing or shelter in place orders. By observing, by observing these restrictions strictly, we are far less likely to become infected. And by heeding these restrictions, we are also far less likely to harm others by passing on the virus, even when we have no symptoms and even when the others in question may be people whom we will never know. The coronavirus hides in tiny respiratory droplets and show itself only under a microscope or when it emerges as a ref refugee illnesses. Because we cannot see, touch, or hear the virus, it may seem pointless to take extreme actions like quarantine and social distancing. Since we cannot see it or touch it or hear it, we may also feel anxious and fear that everything or everyone could infect us. Here, it is a crucial aspect of our responsibility to pay attention to credible public health experts about what we should do and not do. Fear alone can drive us to our worst ethical behavior. Fear mixed with common sense and good science can dispose us to take the actions we ought to take. May I state furthermore that no pandemic should change the essential duties of respect towards each other and care for others and for ourselves. And certainly no pandemic should change the requirement of fairness, ensuring that the poor and less advantaged should not be harmed more than everyone else. We have experienced that the current pandemic caused extreme situations that jeopardize things that we normally take for granted. Many people are making use of the healthcare systems, resulting in a system that becomes overwhelmed. We then realize that our usual ethical beliefs about those who should get treated can give way in the face of scarce medical resources and the threat of disorder. While we usually assume that first to come should be the first to be served, the guiding ethical principles for the profession of healthcare during a pandemic should be to save the most lives or to save those most likely to recover or even save people first who can preserve society, such as healthcare workers. As mentioned before, pandemics create fear because risks are great. The coronavirus, for example, can cause serious illness and death. Amid such fear, groups of people can be blamed for the pandemic. As public health workers, we will have to make crucial and ethical distinctions for individuals should be held accountable for their actions after a careful and impartial analysis of their actions, while we should avoid putting blame on groups of people on account of their country of origin or immigration status for actions or even ethnicity due to a possible virus over which they have no control. Decision-making in these circumstances remains ethically challenging for under these unpredicted and extreme situations bring about a transformation of healthcare workers' everyday moral intuitions. The commitment to preserve in the face of an extremely ill patient would be challenged by quantitative decisions based on maximizing the overall reduction of mortality and morbidity and the need to maintain vital social functions. Healthcare workers would be obligated to implement decision-making policies, policies which mean some patients may be denied intensive forms of treatment that they would have received outside the pandemic. Health professionals may be required to withhold treatment from some patients to enable treatment of other patients with a higher survival probability. Even though the Ministry of Health of Suriname has taken up the responsibility to guarantee the best care even during the pandemic, it has ensured that decisions taken are guided by ethical principles including equal respect, minimizing the harm of the pandemic, promoting the intersectoral collaboration and flexibility as plans get adapted based on the changing circumstances, which has so shown to be of paramount importance in the current pandemic. May I conclude by encouraging us as leaders within the public health 
to continue doing all we can to provide the best care for all possible as we take the lessons learned during this pandemic at heart. May I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Thanks uh, for uh, your comments. And we will now um, have with us Mr. Sridhar. He is the Managing Director of Pfizer India. And I think it would be fair to say that your organization has made the impossible possible in record time. You came up with the appropriate vaccination. It would be so insightful for us to hear from you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed an honor to share this virtual stage with such eminent dignitaries and interact with you at all this important conference. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and vaccinated and are online to be vaccinated. Firstly, I already thank the World Forum of Ethics and Business and its founder, Guruji Sri Ravishankarji, for splendid work in creating a platform to propagate the message of trust and ethics in business. This is an opportune time for us to be in meeting, albeit virtually, to discuss how the world has transformed over the last 16 months. We continue to fight our way out of this pandemic, and a vaccine seems to be the only proven, safe, effective way to of keeping this deadly virus at bay. Even as citizens across the world line up to take COVID vaccine jab, there remains a vast number of apprehensive people unwilling to take the vaccine because of vaccine hesitancy or fear of safety or side effects. We at OPPI continue to believe in the concept of vaccination and thus have been sending out messages that vaccine is not only a proven way of recovery for the world, the national economies, communities, and individually for every one of us to return to work. In fact, I would believe that COVID-19 has set the tone for people to understand the importance of vaccination, not just for children, but also for adults. We've been partnering with global organizations like IFPMA to promote exactly this message that vaccines are safe and ask everyone to get vaccinated. Over the last year and a half, we have seen scientists, physicians, funders, and manufacturers come together as part of international collaborations to help speed up availability of vaccines and COVID-19. Several biopharmaceutical companies pressed in their best resources for research and development of vaccine candidates for COVID-19. They collaborated in sharing technologies to allow rapid upscale of production once a vaccine candidate was identified. Dozens of biopharmaceutical companies stay focused on R&D efforts in partnership with global academic institutions, governments, NGOs, and multilateral organizations to ensure the best of the vaccine options are researched and developed in the shortest possible time. Please remember, the path to drug discovery is a long, arduous, and expensive one. Only one in 10,000 drug candidates finally make it to the market. Therefore, in the cost of the lone successful candidate is embedded the price of mild failures. Knowing this well, we need to encourage research and innovations so that the industry will be able to bring solutions to the health challenges being faced with the people, government, and nations. Today, more than ever, the global spotlight is on research-based pharmaceutical industry. Today, more than ever, we need to ensure we propagate the culture of innovation in countries where it has not taken roots yet. For that, certain initiatives are essential. Building, enabling infrastructure, supporting, recognizing, and rewarding high-risk innovation. Strengthening government, industry, academia partnerships, and making available opportunities for investors to fund such innovations are of great importance. Remember, all this can happen only in an enabling and favorable policy environment. 
The silver lining that we have seen over the last one year has definitely been a scale of such collaborations. These collaborations enable uninterrupted supply chains, ensuring last mile delivery to patients, even during the peak of the pandemic. In the recent past two, industry has partnered and supported major health priorities as listed by say government of India as universal immunization, Aishwan Bharat, the country's fight against antimicrobial resistance and encouraging grassroots innovations in healthcare to access pressing national priorities. I strongly believe industry can go even more with the enabling ecosystem provided by the most important stakeholder, the government at various levels. A step forward for industry and the society is to ensure that we nurture these strong partnerships and strengthen innovation and technology solutions such as teleconsulting, Doctor on Connect and others to increase access. The trust and partnerships developed between all the key stakeholders, including patient groups, governments, regulators and industry during the pandemic are beyond imagination and are commendable. The foundation for any relationship is the trust and ethics that form part of practice. Sustaining growth will be highly dependent on this virtue and building and nurturing it with all stakeholders. I firmly believe that the world will emerge stronger from this pandemic, primarily because of the trust in our partnerships and collaborations and ethical ways we run organizations and governments. On that note, I would once again extend a sincere thanks to the World Forum of Ethics and Business for having me here. I wish you all the very best and have a fantastic conference. Thank you very much. Mrs. Sridhar, uh, it's good to hear that you sincerely and firmly believe that the world will emerge stronger out of this crisis. And I think we can just but Thank you and your organizations for the, for the great work you have been doing over the last year. We would now in, like to invite the Honorable Dr. Frank Anthony, the Minister of Health from Guyana. What a beautiful place on this planet. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Christoph Glasser. Uh, distinguished panelists, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen from around the world. Allow me, first of all, to thank the World Forum for Ethics in Business to invite me to speak on the changing paradigms in a pandemic world and how to regain trust, health, happiness, and ethics. Pandemics are nothing new from antiquity to present. There are many examples of ongoing battle between humans and disease-causing microbes. The pandem this pandemic differs from previous pandemics because of the global interconnectivity. Spread became much easier, and within a short period of time, almost all countries in the world were affected. The pandemic effects were further compounded by misinformation, which constantly swirls around social media, creating a lot of fear and distrust. It is against this backdrop that countries tried to slow the spread of transmission with a range of measures such as masking, social distancing, and, it's in, and in its most extreme form, total lockdowns. For those who were infected, home or institutional isolation were available for mild cases, and hospital and ICU beds were reprioritized for moderate to severe cases. Depending on the stringency of the measures taken and the effectiveness of how it was deployed, different countries have weathered the impact of, of the pandemic differently, with some countries having more cases and deaths than others. The crisis is far from over, as the emergence of new variants and relaxing of some of the earlier public health measures and other factors have now created a third wave in some countries and in others, a fourth wave uh, of cases and deaths. On the economic side, securing people's livelihoods have become quite challenging. Many businesses have gone under, many persons have lost their jobs, and there isn't any safety nets to prevent the most vulnerable 
from slipping into Florida poverty. Oxfam has estimated that more than a billion persons have plunged into poverty because of COVID-19. Global trade and supply chains have been disrupted and disparity between the poor and rich countries have become more pronounced. This is the pandemic world that COVID-19 has created. To exit the pandemic and to return to normalcy, a lot of hope has been placed on vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Vaccines offer hope of reaching herd immunity and thereby containing the spread of disease. Unfortunately, vaccine nationalism has distorted the supply and deployment of these vaccines. According to a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine, titled From Vaccine Nationalism to Vaccine Equity, our, and I quote, our current global vaccination rates of roughly 6.7 million doses per day translates to herd immunity, that is 70 to 85 percent of the population, having received a two-dose vaccine in approximately 4.6 years. Vaccine distribution remains non-existent in many of the poorest countries, and experts anticipate that 8% of the population in low resource setting will not receive a vaccine this year. While the actual calculates that it will take 4.6 years to get to an epidemiological end of this pandemic, many rich countries are on target to reach herd immunity by the end of 2021. There is uncertainty about when poorer countries will get there. The theme of this year's uh, Health Day, and today is that day, is building a fairer and healthier world. To do so, we urgently need to close the vaccine gap between rich and developing countries. And failure to do so will create more opportunities for the emergence of variants, reinfections, and new forms of discrimination between those who are vaccinated and those who are not. We have seen the arguments being made now for vaccine passports, and perhaps that's a discussion that we ought to have as well. The urgency of, our, of the times demand that we not only advocate, but we also take concrete steps to make a difference. And there are many ways that we can do that. We need to encourage the WHO to expedite approvals and to offer emergency listing of vaccines that are currently uh, sent to the WHO. Many of these vaccines have been there for months and we have not been able to get them uh, authorized as yet. COVAX, while its pursuit is quite noble, have it as its target to help countries to get to 20% of their population being immunized in 2021. We need to go beyond that because 20% would just not give us herd immunity. Improving the logistics. While we have vaccines that have become available, many poor countries cannot access them because the logistics of getting those vaccines to those countries are just not in place. Uh, there are challenges with planes getting to many countries, and if you don't have special charters, the regular commercial airlines would not take the vaccines there. Richer countries have secured surplus vaccines, and they should now share those vaccines with many of the poorer countries. We have therapeutics that have been developed and are only used in many of the developed countries such as the monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies. These antibody therapies are not available to many countries around the world. And if made available, they'll make a tremendous difference in saving lives around the globe. We also need a global system to track variants, enhancing gene sequencing and enhancing poorer countries' access to gene sequencing, without which we would not be able to understand how the pandemic is changing. These are just a few areas in which we can look at immediately. And I do hope that the debates that we'll be having in this particular symposium would help to shift 
our prevailing attitude from vaccine nationalism to one where we can ensure that vaccine is available to many of the countries around the world. If we are unable to do this in a timely manner, unfortunately, we will see more variants emerging and we would not be able to exit this pandemic uh, very soon. I wish the conference well, and I hope to hear from the other speakers as we address some of the pertinent issues relating to how we can end this pandemic in the shortest possible manner. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Honorable Dr. Frank Anthony. Uh, and we have now the pleasure to invite the Honorable Professor Hanno de Croo, the Minister of State from Belgium, to address us. And I would just like to share that um, the Honorable Professor, uh, as just before we started the conference, shared with us that uh, he's 83 years of age and I think serving as a member of parliament in different functions since 52 years. And Your Excellency, I remember that I had traveled with you and Mr. Poran, who is here in the call, in India uh, extensively for a conference. And while we were at age 40 plus tired, you were always fit and fresh. So as this is the World Health Day, I think we would like to learn from you. We would like to learn and understand your recipe to be so healthy. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, three days ago, I got my first vaccination, following the rules of my country, starting back with the elderly and then going down slowly. Many thanks for you, your remarks. And I was trying to feel and to search for the words in which I could concretize what is happening. Uh, sudden, global, more or less unexpected threat to humanity. Despite regimes, countries, uh, age, race, color, the whole threat of humanity was ahead in our eyes. And, our hearts. and I'm trying to see what kind of words we would utilize if we would try to, to synthesize after all those extraordinary speeches we have been listening to. Then I feel that humbleness is one of the first words we can use. We didn't expect, we didn't know how to react, we didn't have more than one or two hundred solutions in each country in each region, with cities, communities, to try to, to react and to save, to prevent. And it was giving me a feeling of uh, humility regarding what can happen to mankind. A second word which was on my lips is gratitude. Tens of millions uh, and even much more of medical personnel of scientists, of people of all kinds, has been at the front line to try to defend society, a way of living, a protection of the most weakest and others among ourselves. And then finally, a third word was hope. Vaccines, scientists' reaction on an unbelievable speed was giving us as I had three days ago in my own case, the faith that it could be defeated, that we could win the battle of that provocative disease. But if you look to all those words, in my perception, there is one which is important. It is a hard word. It is the demonstration of struggle for life. You see struggle for life in people accepting or not accepting vaccines, in the cure in the hospitals for the most affected of all people under COVID. We see the struggle of life when there's a debate among countries, among production, among the ways to obtain and to have this uh, safeguards, which would be, I hope so, the vaccines. And we see the discrepancy, the differences, the handicaps, of struggle for life. Usually, uh, in our perception, struggle for life is something negative. It is something self-protecting. It's some things of self-defense. And we try to be as uh, capable to save ourselves, ourselves, our community, in the struggle for life. But I believe 
we have to change this perception. The struggle for life has to be regarded as a positive element, as an element of solidarity. There will be no freedom of those diseases we know if there is people in the world who will not be free of the same disease. And I believe that we have to rethink and to refurnish, to reconstruct our way to believe how we can protect our communities and how we can protect ourselves. It is a, a pleading to let us depart from egoistic approach. Solidarity is a chance of survival and is not the chance of survival of a few among ours. And I believe that we have to think with all the organizations as uh, this forum, uh, with all the thinking people, acting people worldwide in all communities, national or international, how can we positivize? How can we change? How can we turn over this fear, this individual fear of surviving, this individual fear of this struggle for life? What can we do to make it a positive element? What can we give it additional to the hope of science additional to the help and the gratitude to medical care, what can we do to stabilize, to make societies escaping to their own egoism, escaping to their self-protection in a society in the world, we can only be survivors as a species, as mankind, if we plead for solidarity. And on the different words of uh, gratitude, of Humbleness of hope, I would like to have the positive interpretation and to ask everybody to collaborate with this, even in the most sophisticated ways we are working, to see that struggle for life is a struggle for life of everybody in this world. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor uh, De Croo. And I think we could really feel um, your energy, we could feel your positiveness, and that gives us a lot of hope. Thank you so much. Now, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar famously uh, says that health is much more than the absence of sickness. And I think one of the dimensions uh, in this world which can give us inner strength and energy is music. And um, as uh, we go through this keynote panel, we thought it would be nice to just relax for three minutes with a great artist. We have with us uh, Mr. Jan Murto. He is an artist from Finland and he will share with us his music. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janne. Um, this felt really, really good. Uh, this was relaxing and energizing. And we need that. We need that in these times. We need uh, traditional medicine. We also need alternative medicine. We need uh, medicine from around the world. And we have now with us an expert in the field of Ayurveda. We have with us Mr. Arvind Vajasvi. He's the managing director of a very renowned institute, the Sri Sri Tattva. Arvind, may I invite you to speak? Um, you start, oh. I think, uh, he will speak uh, in a few moments, so maybe we can go ahead. And... All right, I understand. Um, we have a change in program. And <laughs> after this year, I think we have learned to be agile and adapt. So um, from Germany, we have with us the Honorable Professor Dr. Roland Koch. You, Mr. Koch, you have served as the Chief Minister um, of uh, Hessen in Germany. You are now the uh, chairman of the supervisory board of the UBS um, at Germany, and you are the president of the Ludwig Gerhard uh, From a business perspective, how do you see the situation? May I invite you to speak? Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Christoph. I'm, um, I'm happy to be with you, and um, uh, congratulations to the World Forum, to, to such an um, organization um, in these days. I think that is really important. We are not able to travel as we are used to travel. Uh, we need other kinds of communication and maybe our children will see uh, one of the significant changes in communication, that kind of video conferencing we are more or less all together daily doing now um, as what would, will remain after this pandemic. Um, talking about pandemic uh, situations, we, we always have to have in mind that whenever that happened in, in, in the world, um, and, and it's not the first time that it happens, um, it changes societies, it changes uh, relations between countries, it changes uh, medical infrastructure, um, and it is always a point in history where everybody can remember what happened in that. And that will be also in, in these days. So the question is, what is the difference to other kinds of pandemics? So I think we, we experience the global um, effects on this pandemic um, because we experience the global connectivity and the global dependencies which we see today. Um, this does not solve all the problems, as uh, the honorable colleague, Mr. Anthony, um, I think described um, uh, very good to see that, that we are in still different parts of the world with different dependencies, with different resources, but we are all sharing the same challenge and we have no real chance to split us away from the others to make sure that we are not affected in the same way than others. And uh, this, this creates a lot of um, reasonable challenges for all of us. And uh, may, may still, I would say, we, we are not really able um, uh, to cope with all of them for the moment. Um, and when we look at uh, the question, how do we cope with the word of solidarity, uh, which was mentioned sometimes here, and um, I think, to be honest, we are talking a lot about solidarity, and maybe we do more than we would have done some years ago, but still, there is a question of resources, and resources is not only money, resources is research, resources are infrastructure, sometimes maybe resources are also mentality. As a politician, I think the question is necessary to be mentioned that sometimes people think that autocratic systems are more able to cope with such a situation than democratic societies. And also today, looking to the actual performance of countries all over the world, we still can see that democratic societies have a lot of struggles strategically how to cope with it in an internal way, but autocratic systems do not actually. I'm personally still convinced that at the end, the democratic societies will show that solidarity, cooperation, interaction, all that what is needed to bring society really together um, it can be seen better there, but, but that, that's an issue also in these pandemic times. And what we also see is that we have a new dimension of interaction 
between state-driven organization, economic organizations, and science. Um, a lot of countries at the moment are governed under um, extraordinary legal systems, catastrophe law, or however you will call it, with very special additional authorities for the government. Um, that is very near to traditional war law. So um, uh, it, is, um, it is really um, I'm, I'm creating an authority on government parts um, uh, to change a lot of things which normally were being possible to be changed in that way. But they depend not on their army, which they created. They depend on economic institutions like Pfizer, as we heard. By the way, we in Germany call that BioNTech Pfizer because um, the research done for the Pfizer product was done in Germany. So we are very proud of that. And it's interesting that most people in the world call it Pfizer and everybody in Germany calls it BioNTech. Um, so um, it shows it is still a regional issue. It's a question um, how to work with it. And there we need these economic institutions to cooperate. And looking to the financial capacity, I will stay with this by the BioNTech. Why is it BioNTech Pfizer? It is BioNTech because there was a research institution in Germany, but this uh, small company was never able to really supply the world with that vaccine which they had invited. And therefore they need a multinational global player with all the financial resources to use them to have a supply chain in a worldwide structure to enable them to use their knowledge. Though the state is depending on economic and scientific resources, uh, which he cannot organize alone. There the globalized world is there, and so the dimension of discussion between the globalized part of the world actually now is totally different than it was in the past. And um, I think that is one of the challenges we have um, to match. For me, it is very important that borders should be open in the future. It's not so for sure. Having open borders in the future means that we need also to strengthen the resilience of this single part of the world. So uh, supply chains cannot create dependencies, which at the end of the day force governments to decide between the solidarity of their own people or the solidarity of the world. I think the European Union is very proud to have COVAX as one of the initiatives also to sell some of the vaccines to other parts of the world. But we need to have enough resources in certain parts. And the certain last part, um, I think we still have to bring in time to make sure that in this situation, um, we have to define a world which is under the law of cooperation. And I think for us, the Europeans, people in the US, in other large countries, um, it is a very important part to think about the small countries and the less wealthy countries. We in Europe have an experience in the European integration, which is still a very difficult thing, that the big countries, they may be able to work in a standalone role, but to get a cooperation which enables them to have a peaceful movement of everybody needs the respect and the signal of willing to help, especially in difficult situations. And I think this is one of the most important proofs we have to see for the future. And I hope also conferences like that give us more understanding. I learned a lot listening to all of you and um, it helps us to make that possible um, as one of the most important lessons out of that pandemic, which will change the world as all pandemics did in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Koch. Thank you for uh, making us think about the limitations uh, of our democratic system. And I think it is also very good that you highlight the contribution of Germany <laughs> towards the vaccination, because indeed Germany is going through difficult times. We have now with us uh, Mr. Arvind Vachasvi, the Managing Director of Sri Sri Tatwa. Arvind, we really look forward to hear from you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Glaser. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with all such erudite people, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor to be here um, in this valedictory function. 
uh, such a visionary a conference uh, that what we're uh, actually uh, witnessing here today. We've seen that over the last one year, the COVID-19 pandemic has really taken the entire world by storm. And one thing that what has really uh, brought us together is the aspect of humanity. People are caring for one another. We've seen that, that the aspect of mental health and mental well-being has been championed, especially during the entire lockdown days. We've seen Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji uh, conduct meditations for more than 4 million people um, almost every day during the lockdown period. This shows that people are uh, uh, recognizing the aspect as to um, mental health and also mental well-being is equally important uh, to physical health. Uh, we've seen also the aspect of traditional medicine being given a whole lot of importance during the entire pandemic. At Sri Sri Tattva, we have championed a lot of clinical trials to actually prove the efficacy that even traditional systems of medicine like Ayurveda, Siddha, and also yoga, and also homeopathy and Yunani medicines do have certain solutions that what perhaps we never would have imagined. So while we understand that there are systems of medicine that have been in play to see that how we could address the pandemic, we're also recognizing the aspect that how Indian systems of medicine and also other traditional systems of medicine across the world also do play an important role to maintain one's health. We've really uh, uh, seen that how maintaining one's health is so important in this pandemic, attending to one's immunity, attending to one's uh, uh, you know, mental well-being to see that how you can be of uh, uh, really uh, a great, perhaps a cushion um, and a source of inspiration to people to come across during the pandemic times. Because the amount of mental stress that happens across in people, especially when they go across, you know, this particular pandemic and then and also their uh, families go through a whole lot. So I think it's very important that through such conferences, we do uh, find a road to see how these things could also be uh, championed and also given more importance in the coming days. In the future, especially post the pandemic, I think the world is going to be really different when it comes to the aspect of healthcare. That's uh, a sector that what we are championing and we're seeing that a whole lot of aspect and importance is given two systems of medicine that also maintain health. One, was, one on a preventive aspect and another on the curative aspect. We've seen that perhaps not one system of medicine can be put into either of these buckets. We need to do more research, come across with more findings to see that how which system of medicine might be of use to people and also the patients. So rather than concentrating on the systems of medicine, we need to address the core root and that's what's good for the patient and what's good for humanity at large. We've seen over the last one year, different systems of medicine coming together and looking at solutions to this pandemic. And I really hope that this particular platform, we've seen so many excellencies, ministers, people from the health sector, people from sports, we've seen people from fashion. So every, every, uh, sector recognizes the aspect as to what, whether it is mental well-being or physical well-being, and also attending to one's lifestyle is very, very important during these times. So I think having said these few words, it's really a pleasure to be here with everybody. And of course, I do encourage all of you to take care of your health, take care of your immunity. Um, it's good to be a little selfish when it comes to the aspect of your health, especially during these times. See that you're healthy and I'm sure that through that we would be able to do more across to the world at large. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Arvind. And I think uh, you did remind us that uh, if we want to help others, we have, as the teachers in the airplane first, put the mask on our own face and that gives us the energy then to be available to the world. Thank you so much for your contribution and the great work you do in that sector. We now would like to invite Ms. Tessie Anthony de Nassau. Um, she's a co-founder of Professors Without Borders and lives in Luxembourg. She's a great leader and we look forward to hear from you. Thank you so, so much. Uh, let me just prepare there. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Glaser. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you for allowing me to share some of my insights as really the only woman on this esteemed panel for the World Forum for Ethics in Business. Assalamu alaikum, guten tag, bonjour, and good afternoon to everyone. 
Let me start with highlighting again that today is World Health Day. Collaboration, communication, listening and sharing of resources, especially for the vaccine distribution, as the Honorable Dr. Frank Anthony mentioned, as well are the key skills and actions that we all need to reinforce in our sectors if we are to work towards long lasting sustainable change for a better world for tomorrow. As a UN ambassador for young women and adolescent girls, this day is very important to me and my advocacy, as well as all experiencing, we, we are experiencing it in a horrid way, the pandemic, in our own ways, right? World Health Day has a special importance to all of us. Health is our only wealth, I would argue. Let us invest into it and into the health and well-being of our staff and team by putting the right ethics in place and a toolbox equipped to address the issues of today and tomorrow. A special thanks today as well to our care workers, our doctors, nurses, as mentioned as well by His Excellency Herman de Croo. People often tell me that I have lived a life of at least an 85-year-old woman. Indeed, it is true that I'm a serial entrepreneur and I love absolutely everything that I do, as it is a reflection of me and my work ethics and morals at all times. I was asked today specifically to cover the topic of the fashion industry, as you have heard in other panels before, and to talk about values. Um, uh, you have heard about the wonderful insights of my esteemed colleagues about the COVID pandemic and the medical aspects and the politics of it. So I will choose the other topics now. For that reason, I choose two small chapters of my broad CV for you. The first one, as mentioned, is a bit niche, the fashion industry, a new domain for me as well. I only started really exploring this since two years and how this sector has continued to innovate despite the pandemic. The second part of this speech will address the importance of values within a corporate structure. This will apply to all domains that you have heard today and discussed. The fashion industry has complex connections to many other domains, including marketing, sourcing, processing of raw materials, workers' rights, retailing, and import and export, among others. All are interconnected in some way or another, which makes it a very complex process to create one piece of clothing until it arrives in the home of the consumer. There are many issues to consider within this booming in industry, such as brand name forgery, consumer over consumption, especially in times of climate change, cultural influence and appropriation, body image issues, fur trade, sweatshop labor practice, labor practices in general, and so on. My esteemed colleagues, the audience members, you know all about that and have heard that on the panels today. So today you will have learned all about this and that we need a makeover in that sector, but we also need a makeover in many, many other sectors. And you have learned today how to bring your part to that side of the coin. Hence, as my keynote is quite so short, I want to make sure I leave you with some key facts and incredible advances from the fashion industry and how the application of a moral code has already changed the industry for the better, if sadly not entirely. As my grandmother always states, celebrate the little wins first. These surely will raise trust in a domain which has been put on the spotlight due to climate change and workers' rights. So let's get celebrating, if only for a little while just now, shall we? Improvements have been made across the industry in quite a variety of sectors, especially during times of pandemic. The four most noteworthy areas I will explain to you now, according to the Baptist World Aid Australia. One is gender inequality. 61% of companies, an increase of 22%, have created policies uh, addressing gender inequality in their supply chain, including the introduction of strategies addressing discrimination faced by women. Two, Responsible purchasing practices, 45% of companies, that's an increase of 18%, have introduced policies addressing responsible purchasing practices with an aim to improve working conditions. Three, child and forced labor, 35% of companies, an increase of 17%, have robust remediation plans to redress child or forced labor if it is found in their supply chain. And four, manufacturing restrictive subsidies list, also known as MRSL, 35% of companies, an increase of 14%, have a comprehensive MRSL that they test against to ensure workers are not exposed to hazardous chemicals while in dire environmental impacts, with dire environmental impacts. Of course, these advances are mentioned are really surely inspiring and timely for the fashion industry, especially during times of Corona. 
However, when addressing morals and ethics in business, which this conference is really about, there's one crucial component, which brings me to my second point of this address to you. Company values, especially during the times of crisis and pandemic, corporate values are crucial to raise trust in times like these. Make sure as a business owner, you have a solid foundation of your corporate values and test everyone involved in your business on these values. I would even claim as a politician, my father's a politician since 24 years and I myself has acted in politics for the last decade. I work a lot with my consultancy Finding Butterflies with clients from all sectors to assess, test and refine their corporate values. It is really the glue that keeps it all together. The values are a fundamental set of basic behaviors that aim to maximize in your company themes such as loyalty, integrity, reverence, so respect, and empowerment. Take the value empowerment now as an example. The implication of living that value is that you make sure that everyone in your company has a voice that can be heard. It might be annoying to say, to answer an email or of a low level assistant or temp for some people, not for me, but I know some others who don't always like that, while trying to get your funding round started or closed. But exactly this attention to reply to that email will show you that you yourself care about that value. Because if you don't care, you cannot expect anyone else to care. This also applies to how you treat your staff and every other corporate value that you have identified for your business, for your advocacy, for your politics. That is how empowerment happens. It happens through alignment of behavior. If you tolerate different behaviors, you will end up destroying or lessen the power of your voice, of your company, of your business, whatever it might be. Even as a young professional then, going to the youngsters here, if you're not in the driver's seat yet, make sure you know the corporate values of the company you're working for and observe who in your closest surrounding is living them and who is denying them and what the leadership team comes up with to reinforce these values. That goes with what we have heard before in one of the keynotes that by sharing vaccines, it cannot be that only the rich countries get the vaccines and then the less richer ones are being left behind because it is true, there's already new variants coming and we need to work in this together. So values matter. What is yours? What are your values? Corporate values as a foundation for success cannot be enforced too much. It's like child education. I have two teenage sons, I'm expecting another baby. Have a few rules and enforce them often. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have a set of values that describe your company character, your advocacy. Often in the beginning, it is a mix of character traits of the founders, sometimes enriched by aspiration attributes of them, which they might not yet, but would love to have. I know of a company where the founder was almost legendary you know, for being late for meetings, for example, just to lighten it up a bit. He defined being on time as one of the main values with the inconvenient consequence that he would be laughed at when coming too late to a meeting himself. On the other hand, side, he had these monthly meetings with his employees, right? And when they were late, he would close the room and the people who were late would just need to wait outside, right? You can guess how quickly everyone realized that being on time was from now on a key element of that company culture. I personally value people's time a lot. I try hard not to be late, which always, and to be always prepared for my meetings or the task at hand. That is one, that is one of my values and that is the ethics how I live my life, which includes reading all materials before an important board meeting, right? When I then realize that some members of my team have not attended to their documents, I will literally stand up and leave the meeting because I value my team's time and expect the same in return. This is a very good value to have in your company because time is your most important commodity ever, which comes after your health. Once spent, you can never have a refund, right? This is also a value I teach to my sons every day. Yes, they don't always like it, but it is the truth. To respect people's time and always be prepared, especially during times of pandemic, especially during times of crisis when people are already so anxious and don't know what's happening. And they, a lot of them have lost their jobs. Like in the US, 43 million people have lost their jobs, have lost their health care. In Europe as well, we have a big crisis and in a lot of other countries, right? So just respect people and their time. It's so important and listen. I have exhausted my time already, so now, and I hope that my short keynote has been insightful and thought-provoking. Let's never forget where there are morals, there are values, and where there are values, there's ethics. 
We need all three to create a sustainable forward thinking and good company or business or advocacy equipped for the challenges of today and ready to address the challenges of tomorrow. Climate change, consumer rights, workers' rights, sustainable fashion, pandemics, and how we address them as a team, and the way we market our products in the media and our politics, our political messages and in campaigns. Our youngsters are watching us and in person want to feel, and I personally want to feel proud if one of my sons sees my face on a journal or magazine cover describing the work I have done in the world. Do you? I'm sure about that. Let's get to work and become a better version of ourselves every day in our businesses. As Mr. Roland Koch said, there will always be change in times of crisis. And as Mr. Solheim said, be the change you want to see in the world. Let's communicate, collaborate, and change this world for the better. Yes, it is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. Make it count. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Tessie, Anthony, the Nassau, and... Um... We look now very much forward to the address of Professor Dr. Christoph Lütke from the Technical University of Munich. And uh, Professor Lütke, you have been a lot in the media over the last couple of uh, um, uh, weeks and months. Um, you have been very outspoken when it comes to the topic. Um, and we look forward to hear from you. Uh, Christoph, if you don't mind, may I take uh, 10 seconds, um, uh, Dr. Lütke? Uh, I wanted to reassure Tessie because uh, Tessie was saying she's the only woman at the table. I can assure you I'm always at this table with you <laughs> and uh, we'll make our word count, our voice count. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Christoph, and thank you to the uh, WFEB for inviting me to give a lecture at this uh, conference, which I think could not have come at a better time. Um, well, we have heard a lot uh, today about how to positively go forward from here, uh, what the lessons uh, learned will be from this crisis, and I think this is all very valuable. Uh, but I would like to say mental health is also about honesty. And in this crisis and after this crisis, I think we also have to face some uncomfortable truths. Um, and speaking very generally, I would say uh, regaining trust, which uh, is one of the key issues here, will not be an easy task. We should be clear to ourselves about this. Uh, we cannot ignore what has happened during this crisis because what has affected us around the globe is not just the virus. It is also the, the measures against it. While some of them have been necessary, no doubt. However, in many cases, these measures also have been overly excessive and disproportionate. And they have brought other damages with them, which in quite a number of cases have been much greater than those which the virus brought about directly. The lockdowns and other measures have affected us all in various, very hard ways. Um, and they have brought with them collateral damages in terms of a number of issues. First, in terms of health issues. In order to focus on Corona and COVID, we have often lost sight of every other or many other health issues. And this has led to enormous fatalities, other illnesses, and many uh, other uh, issues. The economic issues we face are gigantic uh, around the globe, and we will see how we can recover. Some countries will probably fare better than others, but around the globe, they will be gigantic. But then there are others like the psychological, mental issues. A recent study by Salzburg University found that a very substantial number of children and young adults face serious long-term damages, which are not due to the virus, but due, uh, due to the excessive measures such as contract restrictions, social distancing, closure of a number of highly relevant places, especially for them. And there is a dramatically rising number of mental disorders and suicides, for example. Then there are the societal issues, which also have been addressed at this Congress. The social divide we are facing, we will have to recognize we have not been hit by this crisis all to the same degree. Those with different kinds of jobs, for example, have been affected quite differently by Corona and the Corona measures. 
Some have lost their jobs, their income, have had to deal with distance learning for their children and struggled with mental health issues, while others have been faring relatively well compared to them. Also, uh, we have been blaming each other. We have been blaming each other for, for example, not respecting Corona rules uh, or other things. And many of these um, instances have left serious scars, have divided uh, friends, uh, colleagues, and, and those uh, who are in politics, in the citizens in general, I would say. My profession, ethics, is calling for a responsible and proportionate response to a crisis like this. And I think this has often uh, failed, unfortunately, I have to say, and we have to learn from, from this for the future. We have to learn from uh, a philosopher that who has not been quoted today yet, I think, that is Karl Popper. Um, Karl Popper uh, um, coined this phrase of the open society, the concept of the open society. And we must be very, very careful not to abandon our open society uh, after this and during this crisis. I think some of it has already happened. But the most important thing uh, in terms of a, an open society is we need to be able to talk about these issues. We need to be able to conduct a discourse again about these, these issues that, that divide us, about the issues that affect us, about the mental issues, about the societal issues, about the health issues. And I think this must be addressed first and foremost to politics. Politics has to regain trust after this crisis or during the and after this crisis. Uh, it, it cannot be uh, disregarded. Trust in politics is at an all time low in many countries. And many will have a hard time trusting politicians at all again. There are gigantic failures, such as in providing vaccines, protecting those at risk, especially the elderly. Also the suppression of diverging views. Um, in Germany, but also in many other countries, we are witnessing uh, directly in, in polls, in the numbers in the polls, a dramatic erosion of trust in politics. And how to counter this? I think the only way, way will be uh, to put the brakes on politics again, to give control back to the people. We need a rollback in capital letters. That will mean limiting political power again, and making sure mutual control, for example, of different democratic institutions is working again during this crisis. Unfortunately, it has often failed. So getting back to the overall topic of mental health and to what it will mean for ending and overcoming this crisis, I think that we will need, and with some of these items, I referred to a colleague uh, from the US who has said this, we will need optimism. We will need less doom and gloom which has been perpetuated so much during this crisis. We will need to get rid of the, all those dystopian predictions. We will need clear endpoints for measures for this crisis. We will need a culture of apologies, a better culture of apologizing to each other to, uh, about what has happened. We will need empathy and compassion with each other and less dogmatism and ideology. And that's, I think, the most important thing. With these, I believe, I hope we can make it and emerge from this crisis as unscathed as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lutke. Thank you for sharing your optimism um, and your deep insights into the, into the matter. Uh, we would now like to call upon uh, Mr. Joe Leinen. Joe Leinen um, has been a member of the European Parliament for many, many years, and he's a board member of the World Forum for Ethics and Business. And I believe, Joe, what you have done for us, you have taken the balcony perspective in this conference. Um, and we look so much forward to kind of connect to you and, 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 and connect to your resume of what has happened today. Yeah, uh, Christoph, uh, you gave me the fascinating task to uh, wrap up um, six hours of uh, excellent uh, really presentations uh, excellent experience and knowledge in so many areas and and so many good ideas that are able to empower everybody of us but as well our communities 
I, I might start uh, really with uh, the impressive uh, opening speech by the director of the WHO, uh, Mr. Tetros, who, who said that the opening session, uh, we have uh, seen uh, the best, but as well the worst of human behavior in this one year, the best and the worst. And I think we sh still should recall the best. Uh, it was mentioned many times, the enormous job that health workers and uh, different uh, public services in the health sector um, have done uh, under extreme stress. As well, uh, one must not forget the, the solidarity and the empathy upon, among many people uh, in their families, in their communities. There was a lot of new sort of connectivity and empathy that has not existed before. People had time to speak to each other but uh, not always maybe uh, quite uh, uh, without anxiety, but uh, as well, uh, I see that uh, families came together, um, friends came together much more. We came down to, to basics uh, in an overstressed world. Now, um, of course, there was as well uh, the worst what we have seen. There is this uh, sheer denial of many uh, that uh, uh, the coronavirus is dangerous. There is the denial that you have to protect from the virus by vaccination. We will see uh, how many uh, percentage of uh, our societies are refusing vaccination. And I think that's not good ethics uh, to deny uh, this pandemic. And of course, um, uh, the uh, lack of solidarity in the distribution of the vaccines and the health abilities, the poorer have to suffer longer. That's the bitter acknowledgement of this pandemic. We know it from other um, uh, elements of, of our world, but pandemics uh, might uh, go deeper in injustice and um, in unfair uh, behavior of uh, people, of nations, or of politicians. And as the Prime Minister of Suriname was said, uh, saying, uh, the aftermath, uh, the post-pandemic, um, yeah, economic crisis, financial crisis, uh, is there enough solidarity in this world to help the disadvantaged, uh, the ones who have not uh, so good chances. And I think there's a big effort to do uh, in the coming years. Uh, the pandemic is not over if the virus is over, but the consequences will uh, stay for a longer time. Now, uh, we all have heard that the pandemic is a big uh, game changer. Uh, and uh, sometimes these changes are disruptive. Uh, we um, will live differently, we will work differently, we will communicate differently. And these uh, sudden changes uh, have created a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression. And um, I as well would, would hope that we find holistic answers uh, to give uh, new hope and to find solutions. And um, there are these easy methods and techniques uh, proved uh, since uh, thousands of years. Um, the power of breathing, the power of uh, really um, meditation, the power of yoga. They are very sim simple methods to, let's say, empower us wherever we live, uh, in all sectors of uh, society, in the families, in the schools and universities, in politics and public administration, in sports, arts, fashion, and all other activities. I think we should use that much more, but it will not solve everything, that's for sure, but it would uh, get a better start, a better approach to uh, be clear what we have to do and to connect uh, much easier to others who are like-minded. Now, I ho hope that the best of human uh, behavior is prevailing in this post-pandemic world. I hope for the best, that we have a stronger international health system, that we have stronger partnerships in science, 
and um, in research, uh, stronger links in civil society, uh, in politics. I mean, there are so many summits coming uh, in, uh, in this year already where uh, the pandemic is the top, um, uh, the topic number one on the agenda. And uh, I mean, uh, if you're not stupid, you have to acknowledge that we live in this one world and th that we are so connected that not helping each other would damage everybody. So uh, I hope as well that we are much more careful with our nature around us, with the animals, with the biodiversity, because we cannot isolate us as human beings uh, from nature. And therefore, uh, I hope uh, that uh, the awareness is bigger that we uh, share the same planet. We have only this one available and um, that we share the same hopes and aspirations. So maybe I, I just want to sum up and thank uh, our president, Rachita Kulkani, and all those who brought us together today. The World Forum for Ethics in Business has always found strategic topics to bring people of different kind together and to look for solutions. And uh, I go out of this afternoon really inspired and really empowered. And I hope this is the same for all of you. And then uh, do our best. Let's do our best uh, that we, wherever we live and work, uh, we transform this knowledge into good practice and into reality. So a great afternoon, a big uh, really uh, acknowledgement of what we have to do. So let's do it. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, this was indeed very insightful and you ended on, the, on that note of gratefulness. And that's exactly, uh, I think, where I would like to continue. I would like, on behalf of the World Forum for Ethics in Business, to thank our partners, 17 of them, uh, tirelessly. Um, they have worked on it, they have collaborated, we have been in touch with each other, and it has been a real, real joy. Thank you so much to all the partners, and thanks a lot to the team to the core team which made this uh, possible over the last couple of weeks. Incredible, incredible, and thanks so much. Um, now, the conference comes to a close, but the impact can be multiplied by spreading the world, spreading the word uh, on the social media cha uh, channels, and we would like to invite you <laughs> to take on a challenge. And maybe all the speakers here in the panel could start. It will be super interesting. Uh, um, uh, if you could go on your uh, preferred uh, social media handle and share with the world uh, one positive change that has come into your life due to the pandemic, because the world has changed and so did you. And you can hashtag changing times. It will be great. You can do that and invite five more people to spread that. Um, it will help us to highlight the positive aspects of what has happened to us as a humanity over the last couple of months. As a last, this is about connecting to others, but I think to connect to others, we need to be connected to ourselves. And maybe one of the most powerful ways to recharge batteries is a moment of silence. And we thought it would be appropriate to end this session for these last three, four minutes with a short uh, moment of silence and meditation with Swamiji Chotyamaya. The floor is yours. Um, you're on mute, I believe. Thank you, Christoph. So let us sit very comfortably and gently close our eyes with a beautiful smile. Relax your shoulders and take a long, deep breath in the very first act we all did it in our life. And breathe out the last act we do in our life. Relax your arms, right arm and left arm. And keep your body still and immobile.
with a smile, take another joyful breath in. Hold the breath. Mm, slowly relax. Every incoming breath energizes our body. Outgoing breath giving more relief, peace. Take one or two low, deep breaths. Whenever your body relaxes, your awareness expands, mind expands. And place your entire body weight on the seat you are sitting on. Relax your legs. Stomach muscles, chest, the whole body. And observe the breath in the nostrils. Without breath, no life. We are grateful for this breath. Breathe in with a smile. And breathe out with a smile. And listen to the silence. You are peace, you are joy. And become aware of your body and surroundings. Breathe in again. And slowly breathe out. And take your time. And you may open your eyes with a beautiful smile. Thank you so much, Swamiji. I think this moment of silence was wonderful. With that, uh, we come to the close. We wanted to end in time. We have one minute to go. Rachitya, would you like to complete the experience? Thank you very much. Um, what an incredible day it has been. So I want to take this moment to thank everybody who joined in this really global summit, this movement we had today, which we have started. And um, I think a journey of a thousand miles begins with a step. I think we've taken a giant step today. And uh, I hope that we continue walking together on this journey to support each other, to empower each other and to uplift each other so that we create a sustainable, happy future for ourselves 
and for our next generations. And I want to express my deepest gratitude for the vision of Gurudev Shri Shri Ravi Shankar for, for this event and for all that we do in WFEB, to all the board members and to the entire global team, which has worked like a dream team across countries to make this global summit happen, even in these difficult times. Some, of, some have been in full lockdown, some in partial lockdowns, some themselves have been not so well, some had family members uh, that needed care, but despite all of this, everybody came together for this big vision. So my huge salute to the team and um, with a prayer that we, we become fulfilled and happy as a world. I wanna say thank you, stay safe and take care. Namaste. Thank you.